chapter two covers ethics. Does anybody know what ethics is or what the term ethics even means? You have a guess? You've heard it, I'm sure. What's ethics? Help me out, Bethany. It is moral, yeah, right? It's, it's, it's our way of like, what, how do we know what's morally right and morally wrong? Especially because sometimes things that are ethical might not be legal or things that are legal might not be ethical. And so ethics has to do with right and wrong and morality. And what's challenging about that in a country like the United States is we have a whole bunch of people from a whole bunch of different backgrounds all living in one place. And sometimes their morality and ethics could be pretty different. I'll give you a good example. Most of the Western world, so Europe, the North America, South America, they all grew up with a Judeo-Christian ethic, which means their ethics are based upon the Judeo-Christian Bible. So even people who aren't religious still believe in the same ethics as the religious people generally, okay? The idea that like it's wrong to lie. Other places don't have that ethic, right? If you go to East Asia, like when I was in China, they don't think of lying the same way we think of lying. They think of lying as a normal way to help not embarrass other people in front of other people. So like in America, we'll call you out if you're lying, right? Like, oh, you don't be lying. There, they never would. That would be considered really rude. It's far ruder to like make someone else embarrassed in front of other people. It's called making them lose face than it is to lie. And so like even a teacher at school will be like, oh no, you're doing really great. And you're like, no, I really need honest feedback here. No, no, you're, you're really good. Your Chinese is so good. And you're like, no, seriously, I need to know if I sound bad. And so it's just a different cultural paradigm on what's moral um, and what's ethical. Why don't you click? All right. So here's some examples. They have underinflated footballs. That's been a couple of years now in the NFL. How about drug companies who bump up the price of their drug by 5,000% once they realize people are really gonna need it. It's not illegal. I can, you can charge what you want, but it seems kind of crappy. Uber's billing policies. So the definition they give in the book of ethics is normative standards. And you're like, oh, Thanks for giving me a definition that means even less to me than the word ethics. Uh, and generally accepted rules of conduct that govern society. That might be a better definition for us, right? If you think about our community here, there are certain things that we would all think was pretty crappy if someone did them. We value things like honesty. We value things like fidelity or faithfulness. Like if somebody cheats on a boyfriend or girlfriend, don't you think pretty much most people would think that was a bad, uh, a, not a nice thing to do. It's not illegal, but it's not nice, right? So those are the, the generally accepted rules of conduct that govern society. So what is fair then? If we're saying that we want things to be fair or equitable, what do you think someone means? Where do you guys get your notions or your ideas of fairness? Where did you learn what was fair and what was acceptable behavior? So your parents taught you maybe by beating your butt if you did something that was mean. I don't know. Maybe that didn't happen in your house, but happened. What's that? <laughs> yeah, happened in my house. Uh, so that's probably one place where all of us get some training, some more, some less, depending on our parents. And not all parents spank their kids. They might just say, you know, Let's use our words and talk about how this made us feel, right? Or whatever. Um, other places we learn these things? What's fair, what's right, what's wrong? Okay, what do you mean by that? Like, like um, I guess kind of like the like morals. Yeah. Like what's and it's 
kind of like the say what's right. A lot of people are like, to there's two people that say the customer's always right, or the customer is usually right. Uh huh. But sometimes you gotta like, yeah, like change the way you. Yeah. So you're right. Yeah, you're right. So that that whole balancing of we need to keep customers happy, but we can't allow customers to abuse our people. And so what is that balance? That is an ethical issue. And what's normative, meaning what's normal or, or what's not normative means kind of generally accepted. It can vary slightly, but there's a, there's a pretty good consensus, right? Um, you know, you don't mistreat someone who's waiting at your table or something like that and just treat them like crap. And like, we don't, that's not okay here. Some people do it, but other people will be like, that's not okay. And a good boss will throw them out and say, we don't want your business, fool, like that. You don't have to say fool, I just added that on myself. All right, so you learn it from the workplace, you learn it from your parents, you might learn it from friends. You ever had a friend be like, dude, that's not okay, what you just did or said. A good friend will tell you that. Not good friends usually are too chicken to tell you that. Um, you know, I know like at Safford where my son goes to school in their friend group, because they're kind of like these jock boys, it's fine to like tease other people and stuff. But like if you were to tease a special needs kid or someone that the group thought that you were being mean to a group, a person who couldn't really defend themselves, they wouldn't put up for that. I've, I've seen that group of boys actually rough up a couple of kids because they didn't like the way they were treating the, the kids from the special needs class. Right or wrong, I don't know, but that's what they're, they've said. You know, you can pick on people who can defend themselves, but you can't pick on people who can't. That's their, their group code. And I would say that probably fits, generally speaking. You know, it's one thing to tease your friend about something, another thing to pick on some, or a little kid or something. So yeah, it's interesting to watch their little group norm. All right. So... Normative standards, how we behave on average, how we treat each other, expectations on contracts beyond legal interpretation, right? Most of us, I think most Americans, even in spite of what they do sometimes, would say, hey, if you agree to do something, you should keep your word. Most people would agree with, if you were like say, how much do you agree with this statement? Most people would agree or strongly agree with that statement. They might not always keep their word because we're human, but they would agree that that is the normative standard. Would, do you agree with me on that? Do you think most people believe that? Bethany, what do you think? That you should keep your word if you make a promise, right? So this, an interesting thing with normative standards is we don't always perfectly keep them ourselves, right? There are things that we believe are right that sometimes we still break because that's part of humanness too. We're imperfect. So when it comes to business issues, we have to sort of apply the same process, okay? Except sometimes we have established ethical standards and other times it's not as clear, right? With, with ethics, there's like things that most of us would agree are wrong and other things that we're like, I don't know, it depends on the situation, right? And so we can't always agree on everything and especially in international business, you'll just find you're doing business with people who have a different set of standards and you have to kind of, then you have to try to line it out in the contract and say, this is what we will do or not do on this contract. Um, ooh, line cutting. Does anybody feel like people who are line cutters are the lowest form of vermin on earth? Is it just me? Oh, I saw it. I had nod. Allie hates them too, but it's just me and her, apparently. For some reason, what I like about lines, or in England, they call them cues. What I like about lines is it's like they're the most egalitarian way to decide who gets to like go on the next ride or whatever. Doesn't matter if you're rich, doesn't matter if you're poor. You, you take your turn, right? doesn't matter. And, and so someone who thinks that they can just like break that rule, I don't know why that just makes me so mad. I'm ready to fight. And this is why Fast Pass at Disney, giving people who are willing to pay like an extra hundred bucks a chance to cut everybody else, I don't love it. I think it's yucky. I don't know. 
Why don't, you, why don't we just do that here at the college? Be like, hey, tuition is, what is it? $1,600 a semester, 12, I don't know, 13, something like that. Um, but if you pay $2,500, you're guaranteed C's, even if you don't show up for class. And if you pay $5,000, you are guaranteed B's. And if you pay $10,000, you get straight A's. It's pretty much the same thing. We're not going to make you go through the same suffering of everybody else. It's not exactly the same thing because here the suffering is intended to help you gain knowledge and prepare to, to but there the suffering is just standing in line when it's too hot out and someone's got a crying kid next to you. And you're like, for the love of the kid's too small to even go on the ride. Get him out of the line. Okay. This is why I don't go to Disneyland. You guys, anybody here Disneyland lover? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always said, if I want to hear my kids whine, there's way cheaper ways to do it than Disneyland. All right. Anyway. So the one I mentioned there, cheating, right? We refer to adultery as cheating because the normative standard is such that relationships, um, that such relationships breach the social norm. That, that even when it's now that it's not really illegal, to commit adultery like it used to be in the olden days or like it still is in some places most people would be like nah, it's not right right and yet do people do it do you think people who think it's wrong still do it yeah and then they feel guilty about it mm-hmm Yeah, no, or even if they don't do that, at the very least, it's an emotional thing. And what I mean by that is you can think something's wrong, but you could feel so miserable in a relationship or a situation that you start seeking comfort other places, right? And then and then you're in this strange place of like in your brain, you know it's wrong, but you're but it feels so right or whatever, right? Like, and that's we have lots of things like that in the world. Cheating on exams or cheating in school. Most people have cheated in school. The, the data is pretty compelling now. And now that we have stuff like, like chat AIs and stuff, have you seen this about the, the chat AI? You can just say like, write a five page paper using, you know, based on this, and it can write a paper better than like what we can write. And they're like, the, this chat AI, AI and the level it's reached is relatively new, but this last last week during fi or last semester during finals week worldwide, the system got crashed because so many students were using it to write final papers and stuff. And so is it cheating? Yes, definitely, right? Because writing the paper sucks, but it's not intended to be a punishment to you. It's intended to improve your writing skills and your analytical abilities. So that's where we're at. All right, so business ethics then is all of these concepts, but like wound up into business. So we mentioned natural law last chapter, the idea that some things are wrong, even if the, even if the president says they're okay, even if Congress says they're okay, and so we can't always use what they call positive law as a standard because some principles are inviolate. That's the definition of natural law. So, and what that means is some things are just wrong. Now, what's hard about that is you have to agree where that comes from. So slavery, most people would say slavery is wrong. Doesn't matter if you make a law making it legal. Doesn't matter if everybody in your whole country believes it's okay, it's still wrong, right? And you could probably think of other examples of things like that. Even if people say it's okay, it's not, right? Murdering innocent people, even if it was legal in a place. You know, even if there was a purge, it would still be wrong to murder people. The purge, right? So, we can't always follow the law. We can look at the law sometimes and say, well, the law says that's okay. But the idea behind natural law is that even if the law says something's okay, even if the government is encouraging us to turn in and kill Jews, it's still wrong, right? People tried to hide behind that in Nazi Germany. Well, 
the law. And guess what the, the, the war crimes tribunal said to that? No, you knew it was wrong. You, you have an obligation to resist, even to your own death, doing something that's wrong, like massacring thousands of people, right? Another way that people think, so beside natural law, is what's called moral relativism. And what that means is there's no natural law. There is no God in heaven telling us this is wrong or this is right, or the universe isn't speaking this is wrong or this is right. Instead, ethics are based on the situation. They're relative to the situation we're dealing with. Because if I, if, if I were to say, Bethany, is it wrong to kill? You'd say, depends. Well, no, okay. Is it ever acceptable to kill another person? Okay. You just became relativistic, right? Right, no. And that's why when I said it the first time, I said, is it wrong to kill an innocent person? And now I'm saying, is it wrong to kill? And most of us would be like, mostly, yeah. But there may be a situation that arises that necessitates it. Do you think there's people who are like purists on this and are like, it's never okay to kill another person? Even if this person's coming at me with a sword raised to cut me in half, all I can do is stand there and take it because it's, it's wrong of me to use violence. There are some people that are, that, that are that, have that strong of feelings about it. But most of us would say in that scenario, if I was Indiana Jones and the guy came at me with a sword, I could pull out my gun and shoot him, right? Um, or whatever. Um, so there's, there is a bit of relativism in all of our thinking just because of how the world is. We're reluctant to, to like draw any hard line, never kill except self-defense or, you know, never steal unless you're starving, right? Never lie unless she asks you, does these pants make my butt look big? Right, things like that. My wife just doesn't ask me questions like that. Oh, well, that's good. Cause you're like, yeah, it makes your butt look big. Mm -hmm. Like that. All right. It's so that's the idea, isn't it? All right. I like that I'm recording this. I'll probably get fired. That's all right. Um, big butts are not the bad thing they once were. They're in again. Okay. Like the term thick did not exist when I was a teenager, but here it is in all its glory. All right. So religion is probably another place many of us learn our normative standards, our normative ethics, right? We're taught through you know, you know, our religious education, whether that's uh, you know, Sunday school or catechism or whatever, we're taught certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong. And, you know, what's interesting is, like, if you were to take Christianity as a whole, the standards aren't the same across Christianity. Death penalty. What do you think a Southern Baptist would say about the death penalty? Anybody, know, anybody here a Southern Baptist? I think the Southern Baptist Convention holds that it's acceptable that governments have the right to make that decision depending on the needs of their family. I don't know exactly, but... Mormons, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, there's no official position of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on death penalties. Catholic Church, no. Their official position is that it is inhumane and barbaric and that governments shouldn't have the right to do that. Okay? So I just named three Christian denominations and they have differing views on this topic. Okay? And you could probably choose any topic, anything that's a hot button item, gay marriage, Different churches all say, even among Christian churches, would have different normative standards among them. Um, abortion, um, whatever, they're going to be different. Um, and then, you know, and then that's just Christian sex. Then we have Islamic sex. There's a whole bunch of those. Um, and then Eastern religions, which have very often less rigid rules. You know, we, we've got the whole like sin in Western philosophy, right? Like 10 commandments given on Mount Sinai and that's it. All right. 
So categories of ethical dilemmas include things like taking things that don't belong to you. Auden, is it wrong to take something that doesn't belong to you? What about a paper clip from work? <laughs> no, I'm just being silly, of course, but kind of like, it's, is it, I've met people that are like, that is theft. Think of like Dwight on the office, right? Like, you know, he, like, Jim, that is unacceptable. Uh, granted, they did put his stapler in jello, which is pretty bad. Um, so like, how far does this line go down? Like, is it some dollar amount of value? Like, we would all know that you can't take a computer and just be like, this is mine now, right? Or a car. But most people would be like, a pen? Like, like, if you got home with a pen from work, most people wouldn't be like, I need to drive back in immediately. Or they'd be like, whatever, it's a pen. So I'm like, okay, well, where's the, where's the actual line? Like, is it, is it like if it's worth less than $10, $5, less than $1? You know, I don't know. But so taking things that don't belong to you, saying things that you know are not true, that's called lying. Giving or allowing false impressions. We all do that sometimes, right? We say things that make us look cooler than we are or, or make us seem more experienced at this thing than we are, because it'd be embarrassing to admit we don't know what we're doing or whatever. Like that's that's pretty normal human behavior. Buying influence or engaging in conflict of interest. Like if one of you were like, how much are you gonna take to get me an A in this class, Fox? And I'll be like, you can't afford it, right? Okay. Um, hiding or divulging information, taking unfair advantage, committing acts of personal decadence. I could tell you're really focused on the class. All right. W what is an act of personal decadence? And is it immoral? You guys know what decadence is? Anyone? Allie? What are you guys working on? Should I just shut these computers off? Everybody's like on the computer doing other stuff. What do you do on the computer though? Yeah, there's extra slides on that slideshow. So acts of personal decadence would be like, like really living rich and enriching yourself at the cost of other people or something like that. Is it wrong if you're rich to like live all rich? Like to sit on your yacht in a bikini all day long, drinking margaritas? It'd probably be wrong for me to sit on my yacht in a bikini just for all the people, my serving people, it'd be terrible. Maybe you're like, man, could you at least shave your belly? I don't think so. This is part of my decadence, right? Like, uh, give me another mojito. Uh, so when is it wrong? I don't know, like, you know, if you, to have to, is it ever wrong to live too fancy? You don't think so? How do you like? Is it if it impacts other people? Like, like if I could afford like a personal assistant, anybody have a problem with me hiring a personal assistant as long as I treat them right? Like, so you know, like, so I, I think we this is an area where we start to have, we're like, it depends on the situation, right? Because we can, we've all seen people behave in ways that we're like, I don't know if that's okay. Like that seems wrong. Like look at like the Kardashians, right? They're, they live such a life of decadence that they've made a show about them. They're like spoiled little children, uh, even though they're now parents of their own children. And they're, but there's something like their lives are this strange rich person envy slash train wreck. Like you kind of envy their life, but kind of would never want to live the way they live. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. So, 
I think that's that's good. That's one way to sort of like make a line for yourself, right? If you're ever like feel yourself approaching that, like I want this, I want this, whatever it is, this newest version of the iPhone to the point where you don't pay your medical bills, but you get the iPhone or whatever. Um, then maybe you're like, uh, that, that seems a little wrong, right? Anyway, so there's a whole bunch more on there. You know, this is a challenge of life is that we all face ethical dilemmas in personal situations and in work or business situations. So I hate, they, they label these resolutions of dilemmas. I think these are ways that we can help avoid dilemmas. These are models that people use. The first is called the Blanchard and Peel model. That's just the names of the guys who came up with it. And so they just ask three questions. So, so whenever a business has to make a decision, the first question they should ask is this thing legal? And if it's not, then we don't do it, right? But even if it is, so if the answer is yes, then they ask, is it balanced? And what they mean by that is, does it consider the needs of not only the business, but other stakeholders? Are we considering the needs of our customers? Are we considering the needs of our employees when we make this decision? And is it fair to them? And then how does it make me feel? Have you ever had something that just feels icky? I don't know the right, the right word for that, where you're like, you have to make this decision and it just doesn't feel right. That's usually a pretty good sign, right? Like that something's off. Front page of the newspaper test. The question is that I don't like this. How would the story be reported? Usually what I think of when I think of the front page of the newspaper test is if tomorrow this decision I'm about to make were to be printed on the front page of the paper for everybody to see, how would I feel about that? But you could also say if I were an objective reporter who was reporting on this, you know, what would I say about it? Would it seem, if I was being objective, would it seem like this was fair and reasonable, right? So that's the, the idea is these are ways for us to avoid these dilemmas. Let me skip that one. Laura Nash, she's another modern philosopher. She says, you should ask yourself, how would I view this problem if I sat on the other side of the fence? So, Right now, I make the decision from my perspective. Let's say I'm making a decision about my children and what they can and can't do. Is it okay for me to consider, well, how would I feel if I was them? It doesn't mean that if I think I wouldn't like it, I have to not do it. But having thought that through might help me then explain to them why I made the decision anyway, right? Am I able to discuss my decision with my family, friends, and those closest to me? My experience in the business world education world and in the religious world is that when you feel like you have to bury something down deep and hide it or do it in the dark secret places it's not good it's going to cost you something it's going to cost you a burden that you're carrying trying to keep this thing dark and secret are there things sometimes that we can't tell everybody right in this moment sure right i mean i worked in clandestine services i worked for the national security agency when I, you know we had to do things sometimes that we didn't, I couldn't tell my wife about, but some of those things, I'm not sure if they were right, but I had a mission <laughs> and you have to do the mission, but those are good. That's a good question. What am I trying to accomplish? And will I feel as comfortable over the long term as I do today? You ever make a decision quick? And then as time goes on, you're like, Ooh, I don't know if that was probably shouldn't have done that. Right. That's, something to maybe think about. You can't always foresee all the things. There's things you'll do or choose to do and later be like, if I'd understood, if, you know, but that's just called being young or not having experienced that before you learn. The Wall Street Journal model, are you violating any laws? What does this action contribute to my customers, shareholders, bondholders, employees? So again, this sort of stakeholder focus and how will this action affect me, my company, my family, our employees and our shareholders? Again, trying to think just bigger than yourself. And there's other models, Immanuel Kant and the categorical imperative. You guys ever heard of Immanuel Kant and the categorical imperative? A couple of you have, yeah. But <laughs> anybody who's taken business ethics, Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative 
is in essence that you should only do things that you could will should be like the universal law that everybody would do it. So should I lie? Well, how would the world be if everybody lied all the time? If, if you can't justify that under those terms, you can't, you shouldn't do it. He also said that the other way you can look at the categorical imperative was that I should treat all people as if they are not, as if they are ends unto themselves rather than a means to an end, meaning using people in any way to achieve some goal is not moral, but recognizing them as an individual. So now if you come together and you say, hey, you have knowledge and skills that I could use. I would like to hire you to do it. Now I'm treating them like they're an individual who has a stake in this. They get to negotiate for how much they're willing to be paid to do this thing. And that's not just using them as a means to an end. That's recognizing them as their own separate entity. So that's, and then the golden rule, that's the whole do unto others as you would have others do to you. Unless you're British, they say do unto others as you would be done by, which I think is weird, but that's what the British say. Um, Immanuel Kant, this philosopher, he's a German philosopher, he says the golden rule is immoral. And he says, here's why. Casey, why would the golden rule be? No, I won't make you answer this. He says, if you do unto others, if you treat other people the way you want to be treated, that assumes that the way you want to be treated is the way they want to be treated. And therefore, it doesn't take their needs and their thoughts into, into account. Uh, and I can see where he's coming from, but the golden rule is a pretty solid rule for me. Like, if I typically, if I treat people the way I like to be treated, that's pretty safe. But I get what he's saying, which is I should find out how they would like to be treated and treat them the way they would like to be treated, even more than treat them the way that I would like to be treated. I thought as an interesting take on it, but you know, Immanuel Kant, Jesus. Sorry, Immanuel. Gotta go with that. <laughs> All right. So here's what you were talking about. You're talking about how we sort of rationalize, right? We like, we're doing this thing we know is wrong, but we say, well, but they did it to me first or, or whatever, right? And so these are some rationalizations. And the reason they sort of share them in this ethics section is you should actually like maybe consider them. Let's so that like when you say it, you know how stupid it is, right? Like what well, everybody else is doing it is dumb. If something's wrong, it doesn't matter if other people are doing it, right? Now, when there's something you're not sure if it's wrong, I don't think it's necessarily a bad tool. I think there's the difference, right? If you know it's wrong, rationalizations are ridiculous. If you're really uncertain, right? Like, how should I dress if I'm going to a party like this? I've never been to a fancy party like this one. Well, then finding out how other people dress to it is reasonable. Unless, of course, the way they dress to it goes against your own moral codes. And you're like, oh, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to show up half naked to that party. That's wrong. I'm not doing it. And you can't say, well, everybody else does, so I guess I have to. Not if you think it's wrong. But if you're not sure, that's a good tool. If we don't do it, someone else will. If we, you know, someone's going to sell drugs, so might as well, we might as well make the money. That's the way it's always been done. <laughs> we'll wait until the lawyers tell us it's wrong. Like, this just feels wrong. We're just going to keep going until the lawyers are like, hey, what are you doing? You'd be like, wow, you never said anything. It doesn't really hurt anyone. Well, the system's unfair, so we just have to do it this way. There's, uh, there's our Nuremberg trials. I was just following orders when I killed those 30,000 innocent people. Well. And yet, in a combat situation, don't we sometimes kill people? That's different than you know, taking innocent civilians and putting them in ovens, right? And gassing them and things like that. That's much different than saying they have soldiers on their battlefield and we have soldiers on our battlefield and, and we, we, we killed their soldiers. Combatants are different than non-combatants. Um, do you think this is bad? Well, you should have seen this, right? Like, yeah, what I'm doing is wrong, but it's not as wrong as what these guys were doing or what we used to do. It's like that. And it's a gray area. 
although some things legitimately are a gray area, right? So again, if you know it's wrong, then these things, these rationalizations are wrong. But then there's the things we really are like, I don't know what's right or what's wrong. It's legal. Other people do it. I don't feel bad about it. I just, so what is up? You know, then it's a good judge. But when you like, when you feel like you know something's wrong, try to avoid rationalizing, rationalizing it. All right. Social responsibility is tough because businesses have a duty to inherence. And inherence means to recognize that the business is owned by shareholders and that the business's primary function, its inherent function, is to benefit its owners. I don't think anybody doubts that that's true, right? Your family owns a business. Its primary function is to take care of your family. That's why your dad started it, okay? Now, he hoped that he takes care of customers too, and they have a positive experience. But the problem with inheritance is sometimes we can serve shareholders to the point where we don't care about anybody else. So this guy, Friedman, Milton Friedman, won the Nobel Prize in economics. He believed in inheritance theory. That in essence, if businesses would just pursue their own self-interest, and if we all pursued our self-interest, then that would produce the most value for society, okay? Anybody ever read books by Ayn Rand or Ayn Rand? Check it out. She believed in that, and it's a really interesting philosophy. And there's some experiences that you've had. Have you ever pulled up to a stop sign, and there was some dude there who clearly was stopped before you, but instead of going, he does the whole, like, and so then you're like, like, do I, I mean, but you were stopped. And so instead of if everybody had just pursued their self-interest in accordance with the law, which is whoever stops first goes first, traffic would have run smoothly. But instead, Mr. Nice Guy slowed everybody down by trying to be a nice guy, right? So inheritance is kind of like if everybody just did their, you know, you follow the law still, but then you pursue your own self-interest, that's what's going to be best for everybody. You ever have someone hold a door open for you, but you're like at that awkward distance from the door where it's like, yeah, you feel like, <laughs> right. And you're like, I would have been fine opening the freaking door for myself, man. But now, and it's like, I always like this little fake like hustle. Like you gotta like, thanks man. Right. And you're like, just freaking go. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's always like you have to like put on the show, but then if you hold the door for someone and they don't put on that show and they just keep sauntering, you're like, what a dill hole. Right. Right. Yeah. Like anyway, so the idea behind inheritance is like quit being nice to people, create mutually beneficial relationships. And that's, what's gonna, that's what's gonna make the world a better place. If I'm trying to get rich and you're trying to get rich and we have skills that we can use and we both agree to it, that's what's best for society, not trying to be nice because trying to be nice usually creates all sorts of other issues. That's the idea behind inheritance, okay? So the problem with it, of course, is then it leads to us like, like the robber barons of the 1920s just crushing the poor, right? And being like, Self-interest. So then they came up with this philosophy called enlightened self-interest. The idea is we still are going to seek our own interest, but we recognize that doing good to others may be beneficial to us, right? And so in the case of, say, like a business, treating your customers a certain way might cost a little more money. Having cookies there for them might cost a little more money, but it's going to build value. And so we, we, we're going to enlighten self-interest means not just seeking my best interest right now and in this moment, but seeking an environment that overall creates the best interest, okay? The invisible hand is that means that when people are all pursuing their self-interest, there's like this invisible hand that guides our behavior in a way that isn't what's best for society. That's the idea. And then there's this group of people that believe in what's called social responsibility, that 
businesses and management serves the larger society as a whole. If you have a business, it's not just for you to get rich from, not even for you to get rich from and your customers to have a good experience, but you are a part of a larger social organism. You should become involved in political and social issues, encourage your managers and others to be involved. What do you think is the downside to this? Okay, so it can create that type of issue where you're on the wrong side of people you're, or you're upsetting customer groups, right? Okay, good. Or I, I think that's a major issue with it. Or the other side of it is, is like, you know what? You guys ever see like some sort of movie star come out with a certain opinion on something? You're like, who gives a crap what you think? You're a movie star, right? Like, like you stick to making movies and let the politicians stick to government, right? Like sometimes people overreach. So I think with any sort of political philosophy on social responsibility, there's a chance for people to overdo it. So self-interest can be good as long as you remember you are part of a community and you can't just crush other people. And also like this social responsibility can be good until you overdo it to the point where you're trying to run other people's lives um, and not allow people the freedom to seek their own self-interest as well. All right. So most people take a utilitarian view to business ethics, meaning if business ethics don't benefit them in some way, they're less likely to do them. And so they've done lots of studies and they found that, for example, firms with written codes of ethics did substantially better as an investment than the general Dow Jones composite, which is just meaning 30 different companies all averaged together. So being ethical seems to make you actually more competitive and make you a stronger business. Um, being unethical tends to cost you. There's some examples of there millions and millions of dollars if you don't do things the right way. And so we've passed laws in the United States that say you don't have to have a code of ethics and you don't have to train your employees in ethics and you don't have to, but if you'll do all these things and then you do have a breach at your company, meaning somebody does something really bad, you know, steals from lots of people or hurts your clients. If you have all that in place and you can show that you're actually trying to do it, the government will recognize that this is a, a lone actor sort of doing something bad, not that your company has a is a is an unethical company, and you'll get lower sentences, meaning the fines the company may have to pay or things like that will be lower if you are doing everything in your power to be ethical. Sarbanes-Oxley Act, you'll hear about it in a lot of classes. It's just a law that has done that, that very thing, sort of limited the, the pain a company will feel if they have an ethical breach, if they have an ethics program in place, okay? Let's see, and I think that's it. So the, the main idea of this chapter, guys, is just to recognize that even though this course is about law, there's a whole nother area that we have to consider that's going to impact our behavior and the legality of what we sometimes things are legal but still wrong okay and we need to consider those as we make decisions i know that one was long and i'm sorry but wednesday we'll do something more fun on thursday i know we don't have class but there's going to be like 450 high school kids roaming around this north part of campus um and this building will pre pretty much be shut down from about 8 a.m. till about 1 p.m. because it's FBLA and they're using this as a testing center. So just warning you ahead of time is all. Bye. Have a good day.